So while they're doing that, I'll introduce our next speaker. And I spoke with him on a Zoom meeting, and he said, I'm a dendro, a dendro chronologist. And I thought to myself, what is that? So I did a little work. And he's a Regents Professor Emeritus and was director of the Arizona, uh, the, at the laboratory of the Tree Ring Research University of Arizona. He studied wildfire history and ecology in pine and giant sequoia forests in the western United States, Mexico, South America, and Siberia. In addition to basic research, he's interested in applications of science in natural resource management and in science education. He's got lots of honors. He comes to us from Jemez. I'd like to introduce him. Would you please welcome Tom Swetnan? Thank you, Tom. It's my pleasure to be here, and I thank the uh, thank Tom and and the board for inviting me to come and talk. It's really a special pleasure for me to come and share with you uh, some of the history of dendrochronology and its applications and uses in studying. Uh, environments and human societies over centuries and even millennia. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to be able to do this here in New Mexico where I was born and raised and now I'm retired here living in Hamas Springs and so I've been able to turn my attention a little bit more to this landscape and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history of dendrochronology. Dendrochronology, by the way, that word, that name, it's from the Greek dendro means tree in Greek and chronos time or so dendrochronology is tree time telling or using trees for learning about history um, so I'm going to tell you about some of the history of how the the field was developed and and first originated here in the southwest and and then applications um, a real quick run through of some of the applications of dendrochronology and uh, examples of using tree rings to study fire history and human history right here in New Mexico landscapes and then last, I have a couple of sort of interesting little stories about trees and how trees can speak to us and tell us stories if you know how to listen to them and listen to their rings in particular. So, tree rings. This group, I'm sure, all knows about tree rings. You see them every day. You take a slice out of a tree. Let me go back here. Take a slice out of a tree, and uh, you can see the rings, the layers of growth. And generally speaking, they're annual. They're laid down annually. And then conifers, of course, very distinct. You get the, the lighter colored wood um, that's formed in the spring and summer, and then that dark band, that, that dark layer, is put down late summer, and then the tree goes dormant. So it's that combination of the light and dark in one, one, one year. Now, the key thing that really is the basis of dendrochronology is that there's variability in the rings, right? There's wide rings and there's narrow rings. And generally speaking, in dry landscapes like New Mexico, the wide rings are wet years. Makes sense, more, more, more moisture for the trees. And then the, the narrow rings are drought years. So right there, that's, that's the information that we can get from tree rings. One of the kinds of information is climate and drought, drought years and wet years. But that pattern of variability is what enables us to cross-date match tree ring patterns between trees, and I'll tell you about that here in a minute. So the field of dendrochronology was established, the whole science really was sort of founded by this guy, Andrew Ellicott Douglas. And he was an astronomer working here in Arizona around the turn of the century, 19, around 1900. So uh, there's a big cookie for you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a cross section of giant sequoia in the, my laboratory in Tucson. But there's Douglas, and he started working on tree rings early on um, in the, around the turn of the century, around 1900. And he was an astronomer. Let me go back here. He was an astronomer, and he came to Arizona first. He was working for uh, an astronomer by the name of Percival Lowell, who was a wealthy guy from Massachusetts who you know, had, had enough money to build his own telescope. And, he, and Douglas was his assistant. He sent Douglas out to... Arizona, New Mexico, to find a place to build an observatory. And he did, Flagstaff. They built this observatory on Mars Hill, right there above the city of Flagstaff, still there today. 
the Lowell Observatory. Douglas built, personally built the first observ observatory there around 1894, and he worked for uh, Percival Lowell. To make a long story short, uh, his relationship with Lowell didn't last very long because Lowell, you might know this story, Percival Lowell believed there were canals on Mars. <laughs> Through the telescope, you can see these lines, and he thought they were canals created by some intelligent uh, civilization that had gone past and Mars. A wild idea, but he was talking about that on the turn of the century. Douglas disagreed with him, and so he fired Douglas. <laughs> so Douglas was looking for a job, went to the University of Arizona in Tucson, and was taught astronomy there for the rest of his career. Well, so how in the world did an astronomer start looking at tree rings? Well, Douglas, Douglas was interested in sunspots. He was interested in the variability in the numbers of sunspots. So if you look at the sun with a filter on your telescope, you can see these dark spots, which have to do with the dynamics of the sun. And it turns out that the numbers of spots that occur on the sun vary through time. So some years there are very large number of spots, and some years there are very few. And so going all the way back to Galileo, who was really one of the first astronomers, looking at the sun, he was able to count the sunspots, and astronomers have been counting sunspots ever since. And so we have a time series there at the bottom, the number of sunspots. And it turns out that there's an 11-year cycle, a very strong 11-year cycle. Okay, so even back in 1900, people knew about this, and of course they thought, well, the sun is varying its sunspot cycles, and that had maybe has something to do with the amount of energy that's coming into the Earth's atmosphere, and it might be affecting our climate. So how do sunspot cycles affect the climate? So Douglas was looking for climate records to compare with the sunspot records. Climate records were too short at that time. The rainfall gauge records are only 20 years long for most places like Flagstaff. So he hit on the idea of using tree rings. He, he could see on the, the tops of cut stumps, and there were many cut stumps around Flagstaff. You know, that's a big logging history there going way back of cutting trees and big sawmills. And so he was able to see on stumps the variations in rings, and he started measuring the rings on stump tops and cut-ins of logs and putting those measurements together and comparing them with rainfall records and comparing with the sunspot records. That's how he came to doing tree rings. So it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a, a pathway he took to get from uh, astronomy to uh, looking at ring width patterns and climate and sunspots. And, Along the way, he learned that you could match the ring patterns between trees. Here he is making a little plot, what we call a skeleton plot of ring width patterns on an increment core. So that previous, uh, you could see there, he was coring a tree with an increment borer. I'm sure many of you have used an increment borer. You've seen one. It's a drilling tool that you can take a core sample out of a tree. So Douglas took many hundreds and thousands of tree ring samples, and he started comparing them and matching the ring patterns on the core samples between trees. So here, now this is the basic idea, the most basic idea of dendrochronology, cross-dating. You can match the patterns of rings, of wide and narrow rings between trees because climate is affecting, the rainfall is affecting the trees in a similar way. So if you take a core sample from a living tree, you see that pattern of wide and narrow rings, wide rings, narrow rings, very distinctive pattern, almost like a, like a fingerprint, right? And you take it from a living tree, and then if you take a core sample from a dead tree, it will often overlap in time with the sample from the living tree. And you could match those patterns of wide and narrow rings between the trees, and thereby determine the date that that tree died. So this is a dating tool. You can actually determine the dates of when past trees, past tree ring growth occurred. So then ultimately extending this and bridging it back and further in time, you can take samples from ancient dwellings, the timbers, the roof timbers, or the floor timbers, or the lintels over the doors and windows, and you get a sample from those, and then if you, can, you can compare them with your chronology, and this way you can build further back in time. And so Douglas was doing this in the first decades of the 20th century. He was building up chronologies of 500, 600, 700 years long from living in dead trees. And the archaeologists at the time were excavating these great ruins, the cliff dwellings and 
Colorado and uh, Chaco Canyon, Pueblo Benito, the great houses at, at Pueblo Benito. And these structures are full of wood. I mean, the roof timbers, especially in the cliff dwellings, but also down in the, the, the ruined mounds of Chaco, thousands and thousands of timbers, literally hundreds of thousands of roof beams, you know, eight or 10 inch diameter logs up to 20 feet long still in those ruins. And so the archaeologists were pulling these out, and they heard that this guy, Douglas, could cross-date old wood. He could tell when a tree lived and when it was cut down by matching ring patterns. So they sent him wood and asking him to please try to date these for us and tell us when these structures were built. So he started working on that. Uh, this is about 1915 or so, and through the 20s, it took him about 10 years to uh, finally date the ancient dwellings. The problem was these living tree chronologies went back about 600, 500, 600 years. And when he started looking at the, the timbers from the old dwellings, they didn't cross, they didn't match because they were too far back in town. The timbers in the old dwellings were off the end of the existing chronology. So Douglas had to find the wood to bridge the gap. So there was a gap between the chronologies from the, from the ruins and the living tree chronologies, and he had to find the wood to match it. So he went to the Hopi villages in Arizona, and he sampled the roof timbers, and that didn't quite do it, but they kept, kept at it. And finally, in 1929, they found the wood, and it, they were actually finally able to connect the chronology from the ruins at Chaco and Mesa Verde and all the old, the ancient Pueblo ruins with the modern chronology, and that was revolutionary. That was, that was like, you know, the first time you'd use, they'd use dendrochronology to really date a very serious, important archeological question. It published in National Geographic magazine, Secrets of the Southwest Solved by Talkative Tree Rings. And the full, full illustrated article, it tells all about Douglas's uh, use of the method. So that made Douglas famous, it made uh, dendrochronology famous, and since that time, um, the method has been used all around the world for dating everything from sunken Viking ships to Stradivarius violins to you name it, uh, the oldest trees in the world. Um, yeah, speaking of the oldest trees, uh, Douglas, Douglas uh, developed the method. The Laboratory of Tree Research was established in 1937, and then he hired Edmund Schulman, um, and Schulman was a climatologist, and he was interested in old trees and he looked and found the oldest living trees in the world, the bristlecone pine. So Schulman was Douglas's associate at the tree ring lab in Tucson, and he published this, this report, Bristlecone Pine, Oldest Living Thing, in 1958. And so uh, the bristlecone, the oldest ones are close to 5,000 years old, living ones. And then, with bridging back in time with deadwood, we have almost 10,000 years of continuous tree ring chronologies from the bristlecone pine in uh, the Great Basin in California. Uh, amazing species, useful for climate studies and for radiocarbon dating and calibration. There's another whole story there on use of bristlecone pine. Well, the tree ring lab in Tucson, it grew from Douglas's and Schulman's day to today. We have about a dozen professors and at any time, 20 or 30 graduate students and another 20 or 30 staff. Um, and we just built this building 10 years ago, I say just. Uh, I was fortunate when I was director there, we got a, a large gift from a private donor and some grant funding from the federal government. And we built this entirely new laboratory uh, at the University of Arizona campus. And uh, I welcome you to come and visit sometime at the lab. It's, it's designed to show the science. There's an exhibit hall, and there are docents that do uh, tours, and they welcome visitors to come and, and, and hear the stories and see some of the amazing specimens that are there. Again, just kind of a quick one through. I mean, tree ring dating, the basic idea, if you've got wood with rings in it, like the top of violins, and you know, great, the great Stradivarius and other violins and violas and all those wooden instruments, they usually made of spruce, spruce wood, and terrific tree rings. And so we're able to actually date those and tell when those trees were, are alive and approximately when they were cut, and that can tell you whether or not that's a, that is a authentic Stradivarius. If, a, if it was cut after Stradivarius died, then obviously it wasn't, wasn't built by Stradivarius. Um, all sorts of stories, which I won't go into, 
tree rings and volcanoes, um, big volcanoes that put enough uh, dust in the upper atmosphere cool off the whole planet. And it freezes at the upper elevation, that tree line where these old trees grow. And so the rings have a frost, what we call a frost ring. It's a damage zone where the, where the cells actually froze. And so we've been able to date big volcanic eruptions going back thousands of years using tree rings. And fire history, which is what I'm going to talk about here in a minute, is my specialty. Uh, fire scars and trees can give us really detailed histories. And climate, of course, climate history uh, is probably the, one of the most useful applications. We can study rainfall, temperature, and stream flow. Basically, using the ring widths, we can calibrate, we can, we can compare the ring width, measured ring width patterns with gauged records of stream flow, and thereby go back in time and compare the current droughts and current low flow periods with past flow, flow periods. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the fire history. This is just an example. Fire scarred trees. These are amazing trees that, that I've recorded past fire events in a lot of detail. And they're common in the pine forest. I'm sure you've seen these trees where you've got a blackened, charred area at the base of the tree. Old foresters call these cat faces. Why exactly? I'm not sure. But there are places where the fire burned through the bark and into the cambium and caused a scar. And then after that first scar, the bark is removed. And so pitch and resin comes out of the wound boundary. So then subsequent fires reignite on that surface. And then what you get is a sequence of overlapping scars created by the fires and then tree ring growth over the top of those scars. Right? All right? And these are you know, typically lower severity fires. Otherwise, you know, the tree would have been killed. They're, they're low intensity, few, few, few feet of flame length, but hot enough to ignite on that exposed surface. And so these records are just remarkable. They, you know, we can get um, here in these pine forests, Ponderosa pine forests in New Mexico, not uncommon at all to find a fire scarred tree with 10, 15, sometimes 20 or more fire scars on a single tree going back over 300 years telling us that fires were super frequent in time. So uh, here's just a quick example of a fire history from a study area. A uh, little hard to make out maybe, but that's a, that's a Google you know, satellite image of the Hamas, part of the Hamas Mountains near Battleship Rock, if any of you've ever been there. Uh, there's a little development called Sierra Los Pinos right over here. But this is a square mile, this is a, this is a section, a square mile, and each of those red dots is where we have a collection of fire scarred trees, usually two or three nearby each one of those red points. So this is a very well studied landscape with a lot of fire scarred trees sampled in a ponderosa pine forest. And here's what the, the chart, the fire chronology looks like. And this is a really busy chart, so bear with me a minute. I'll, I'll simply all it is is a, it's a record of fire dates on individual, at individual grid points over that square mile section. So each of the horizontal lines here is a grid point with two or three or four trees with fire scar dates uh, composited for that tree. So these are all the grid points over that square mile. And all of the little black vertical tick marks, those are the fire scar dates. And check out the time period here at the bottom. A little hard to make out, I know, from the back. But it goes to 1350. This is 1500. This is the Pueblo Revolt at 1680, and this is the 1700s and 1800s, and then here's the modern period after 1900. So a couple obvious take home, a lot of fire. These pine forests were burning once or twice per decade for centuries, just frequent, frequent fires. Lots of lightning and plenty of people setting fires. So native people are using fire to clear the landscape, and lightning is setting fire. There's lots and lots of fire. But then look what happens around 1900, after the introduction of livestock, sheep and mainly heavy sheep grazing, and then suppression of fires by the government, putting fires out, we call the Smoky Bear effect, very few fires. So very, very few fires are recorded after 1920 or 30 or so. This, is, this period was way different from what it was back here. And of course, there are big consequences for the removal of frequent surface fires from these forests. Led to 
many more trees growing in, for one thing. Well, so we have networks now of these tree ring fire histories all over Western North America, other parts of the world. And so we're able to now put these together and look at the history of fire uh, over big landscapes, continental scales even, and compare it with climate. So remember I was saying that use tree rings to study rainfall history and temperature. So we have these other chronologies of drought and wet periods. And we were able to use those to map uh, the drought. So this is like the year 1748. The darker brown color is the drier areas in 1748. This is actually one of the driest years uh, in the western United States in the last 500 years. And it was preceded by a really wet year. 1747 was really wet. And then 1748, really dry. And then it burned. So this is actually the largest fire year in the western North America. It shows up in about two-thirds of all the sites we've ever sampled in western North America. Huge, huge, just areas burning. And there's a time series over here. This is actually a tree ring. The 1748 year is a tiny little wedge. By the way, trees don't always grow rings every year. In the driest years, they will not grow a ring, or they'll grow just a tiny little wedge of a ring. So we have to deal with that when we're cross-dating the fact that there's missing rings in the sequences, too, during the driest years. Well, here's, here's a composite of all those sites over Western North America, the percentage of sites uh, recording fires per year. Actually, in this composite, 1748, just about 40% of all the sites were recording fire in 1748. There's other, all these other really big years. These, as you might expect, they're very well correlated with drought years but also so often with prior wet years, which seem to accumulate the fuels, and then when it gets dry, it really burns. And then see what the, how the 20th century and 21st century really looks different, a drop, drop off. Now, re incidentally, as we come out to the 2020s, we're starting to see many more fire sites recording fires. We're starting to come back up again because of the increased burning, because of the fuels, and because of climate warming. Right? So things are changing. We're kind of going back, despite our efforts to put fires out, they're re recurring with a vengeance. So I'll talk about that a bit more here in a moment. So I just wanted to mention that these records. This is the amazing thing about trees. They're just, they're just fantastic rec recorders. And you know we've got our ordinary trees, and then we've got these, these really special trees like giant sequoias, up to 30 feet in diameter. I'm sure many of you have seen these, these trees. They're just mind-blowing. And all the big trees have fire scars on them. All the big old sequoias have fire scars on them. And we were really lucky to be able to go in there. In the 1990s, the Park Service contracted with us to build fire histories in giant sequoia groves. And there's a lot of stumps and logs. So we weren't taking sections out of big trees, uh, living trees, you'll be happy to hear. But we, there are all those stumps and logs. We were able to get uh, hundreds of cross sections. There's, this is a big display section that's in the parking lot in front of the General Sherman tree the largest tree in the world. And so we, we set up shop there, sanded, put a really fine surface on this with belt sanders and, and generators to run the belt sanders. And we dated the tree rings on this big cross section. This cross section, the innermost date is around 250 BC. So 20, you know, 2200 year old tree. And it had 86 different fire scar dates recorded on this single tree. Um, out to 1950. So we ended up with about 3,000 years of fire history from the giant sequoias. And uh, we were able to study the climate relationships with that and published on that in several papers. And it's been very important to kind of support the, the Park Service in reintroducing fire. So you know we've had problem with sequoias in the last two fire seasons. We've lost about 20% of all the largest giant sequoia trees in the high intensity fires that are occurring in the Sierra Nevada. 20% of some of the oldest trees in the world in two years. What's causing that? Warming temperature and drought and the fuels that have accumulated from 100 years of putting fires out. So the Park Service, using this knowledge about fire history as a basis for reintroducing fire, have been doing prescribed burning. And the groves that survived the fires in the last couple of years were ones that had been thinned with prescribed burning and some chainsaw work also. They did some chainsaw work in some of the groves and to thin out the fuels. And those are the groves that have survived. So um, 
we need more of this kind of reintroduction of fire in our, in our special places if we're going to keep them. So, the, again, the, the, the human history is reflected in the fire history, and we see that when large numbers of sheep were brought into a lot of these landscapes, and there were a lot of sheep in New Mexico, you look know, at 5 million uh, sheep in 1890, <laughs> and so what the sheep were doing was they're eating the grasses, which is carrying these frequent fires, and they're also making trails up and down the mountains, and those were preventing the fires from burning in the groves. So we've been able to use fire histories to learn more about human history. And New Mexico is a great place to do that because, you know, there's all the Spanish land grants, the early Spanish history going back into the 1600s and 1700s, and they were introducing sheep into certain areas. So some canyons and some sides of mountains had lots of sheep early, and we see interruption of fire regimes when the sheep are introduced, basically. And so that actually is giving us a, a little more knowledge about when people are affecting the landscape in different ways. Overall, um, we know that there have been lots of changes of these landscapes, and we can see it in old photographs. So here's, a, here's from the Hamas Forest Reserve 1904 report. Those are big trees for the southwest. You know, we're talking three feet, four foot diameter ponderosa pines. And that's kind of the typical look of the understory, kind of clear, not many small diameter trees in there. Um, and you can see this in landscape photos. This is a panorama showing uh, Redondo Peak. If you know the Jemez, that's the tallest mountain. And, and then this is the Valle Grande over here on the right. And notice how open the forests look. Here's a zooming in on the South Mountain. Notice how open the stands are. You can see the ground underneath the trees. Very different looking today. I mean, this landscape is just wall-to-wall -wall trees now, at least the parts that haven't burned in recent fires. Uh, so there's been these massive ingrowth of small diameter trees in these landscapes. So here's a kind of another, not from not a panorama, not from the same location, but you get the general idea. That's South Mountain right there, and it is just basically completely covered in trees now that have grown in with the lack of surface fires. So the low severity surface fires were kind of like this thinning effect, keeping the numbers of small trees down, not killing the overstory, actually providing resilience to these stands. More frequent low intensity fires imparts resilience to ponderosa pine forest, especially. And we can see this, you know, all kinds of old photos. Here's another one. This is actually a, a ruin, a big Indian village ruin, Pueblo ruin, up on the mesas on the south plateau of the Hamas, and uh, this is the ruined mound right here, and this is the same, same viewpoint today. I'm standing in this same spot that that guy's standing in. That little peak right there is that little peak. And so you see how trees have grown in to this landscape. So now these, these structures are being burned over in recent fires and causing damage to the archaeology. Uh, they're damaging the ceramics and the stones there. And there's just no evidence of past fires burning with that kind of intensity over these archaeological sites in the past. But now, uh, you know this story, if you live in New Mexico, this last summer uh, with high intensity fires, this was the Las Conchas fire, this thing burned 40,000 acres in an afternoon. It's a wind-driven crown fire running through Ponderosa Pine Forest with many, many trees, small diameter trees, lots of fuel, hot, uh, spring with wind, and it, it just burned over that landscape. And the problem, of course, is that now we have these big patches of treeless landscapes. So this was formerly trees, all trees, I guarantee you, on the Parito Plateau. It was just a solid sea of trees there. And now there are canopy holes that are more than 10,000 acres in size. And what's coming back there? Primarily shrubs, uh, gambolo, the Mexican locust, the tree, very few trees are regenerating in those landscapes now because there's no seed trees. And it's hot and dry out there with that. And a, a lot of the soil is actually washed off too after these big fires. So this is a really big problem with these high severity fires now burning, super high intensity, taking out the overstory, very different from the, the kind of surface fires that used to burn in these forests frequently. So this is the, a little bit of the story of the archeology span Here's my friend Craig Allen, and in the background here, that's actually a, a little ruin, Indian ruin there. So we, we asked the question, how did, how did the Pueblo people 
live on these landscapes, right in the forest areas. And the Hamas is a great place to do this kind of work because there's dozens of these big villages, uh, you know, with a thousand rooms, or 500 to a thousand rooms. And, uh, how to, and there are, most of them are situated right in Ponderosa Pine Forest. So how did they live there for 300, 400, 500 years and not get burned up? So we, were, we did a study here the last 15, 10, 15 years where we went to these village sites. See the little red dots there? There's the, the Valles Caldera. You know, Los Alamos is over here. This is the southern plateau of the Jemez. Jemez Springs is right about here. And so all, each of those red dots is a big village located mostly in forests. So we went there and we sampled tree rings <clears throat> around those villages just to give you a sense of how populated this landscape was by Pueblo people. In addition to those big villages with 500, five, up to 1,000 or more rooms, there's all these little one, two-story, two two-room two structures we call field houses. They're like little summer getaway places. People stay in the villages in the winter and they go out to these little one-room, two-room structures, and they had their corn crops right around those, those little structures, or maybe their field, their uh, hunting uh, places where they stay for hunting. But there's thousands of them all over the landscape. So this was a very occupied landscape for at least uh, 500 years, from um, the 1200s, 1100s, till the six, early 1600s when the Spanish came in. So again, we were able to go in and sample tree rings, uh, looking for fire scarred trees. There's a fire scarred snag right there. This is a LIDAR image showing the surface, the ground surface, and you can see the ruin. There's the, there's the, the, the mounds, the ruin mounds of this ruin called Sheshukwa on San Juan Mesa. And those little red triangles are where we sampled fire scarred trees that were right growing on the ruin. Well, long story short, um, we were able to get timing of when people were living in these areas from the, the timbers and the, built, the dwellings and from ceramics. And we were able to tell when uh, people probably left these villages by dating trees that were growing right in the village ruins themselves. So once the, the, the structure fell down, the roof collapsed, you get trees growing inside the ruin. So sometimes right in a room block or even in a kiva, you'd have a tree growing out of it. Well, the age of that tree is a minimum time since that has been abandoned, right? It took a while probably for the roof to fall in and for a tree seedling to get in there. So it's kind of a, maybe a decade or two decades after abandonment, but we're able to date the ruins in part by the ages of the trees growing in them. And again, this is a long story short, I'm summarizing it, but so what did we learn? Well, we learned that over the whole Hamas, the time when people were living in those forests there's lots and lots of fires. So back here, oops, back here is the time period when people were living in the villages. And then there's the Pueblo Revolt in 1680. And there's lots and lots of fires. In fact, there's more fires back here than there is out here after 1680, but they're small fires. The percentage of trees recording any given fire is very small, but there's lots and lots of fires. And then once the people are removed from these villages through uh, disease and warfare and the Spanish removing them down to the valleys, then the fires burn freely, but they're not as frequent and they're much more widespread. And there are these, these are the low intensity, frequent, widespread fires. So finally, and then finally you see what's happening during the grazing, livestock grazing and fire suppression period. There's almost a, this bottom graph is showing the widespread fires. So these are fires recorded only by 25% or more of the trees. And you can see back in the period when people were there, fires just didn't spread. Fires didn't spread across that landscape because people were setting little fires on their little fields and uh, using fuel wood. They were using a lot of fuel wood because these villages are at 7,000 plus feet elevation. And they're cutting all the little tim all, you know, timbers for their vigas. So the Pueblo people were harvesting small diameter trees for fuel wood and for architectural timbers, and they were setting fires in addition to the lightning fires. And that landscape was very resilient. There's no evidence of high severity fire or burning back in that time. And they, people were able to live there because they're using the fuel wood and they're keeping the forest open by cutting small trees and also using fire. That's the story.
And it's, I think, a good one because it's, what, it's something we need to aim for. Of course, we can't do it like they did it. Uh, we're, different times are different now, but we can remove sm small diameter trees and we can reduce fire safely. There, these, these stories told in a lot of detail in our papers, and I'd be happy to send you any copies of any of these papers if you'd like to read them. This issue, Archaeology Southwest, has a number of articles in it, including by our collaborators from the Pueblo, Jemez Pueblo, work with us closely, tell us about their history of fire as they know it. And uh, so here's my email address, treering1748, treering1748, treering1748 at gmail.com. Send me a message if you want to get some of these papers. So what do we do? Well, it's possible to remove small diameter trees with chainsaws and with fire and to, to burn, burn up the fuels either with prescribed burning or with piles that are they're created from the thinning and reintroduction of fire. Of course, you know, this has got to be done safely. Um, you know, we got to do it in the right time of year <laughs> and not do it when it's windy in the driest years uh, like happened last year. But there's many, many examples of the use of, of thinning uh, around uh, home areas like the, what we call the wildland urban interface that have interrupted fire. So this is one anecdotal example of 2011. This fire came over that ridge, it was burning down slope, and it hit a thinned area on the edge of a, of a development. So there are many, many homes in this forest right here, dozens and dozens of homes. They were able to catch that fire right there. And I know of personally of, of three examples where uh, thinning uh, projects have saved homes in the Hamas Mountains just in the last 10 years. So it does work. And there's good science supporting it, that, that thinning and prescribed burning works. You've got to do it right. You've got to do it carefully. You've got to watch the weather. Um, so that's that part of the story. I'm going to wind up here with a, with a couple little stories, side stories. One is old trees. You know, we're all interested in old trees. And then I've got a couple examples of sort of urban trees. Um, so. The oldest trees in the, in the Ponderosa Pine in the, in, in the Hamas are, here's this one, it's uh, got an inner ring date of 1333. All right, so that's about a 690 year old tree right there. That is old for a Ponderosa Pine. Most Ponderosas are maybe 300 or so years old, but you can find, you know, 500, 600 year old Ponderosas. And in, elsewhere in the Southwest, you can find old, uh, old wood, old dead wood on the ground, especially if there hasn't been uh, much surface fire in the higher elevation environments. And you can find wood like this log, you know, 767 to 1231 AD. And then limber pine, Pinus flexilis, amazingly old trees here in New Mexico. This, uh, this limber pine uh, from Red River is about 1,000 years old. And then uh, over, curiously, over in El Mal Pais, south of Grants in the lava flows, we find these Douglas fir trees, Douglas fir, growing in the lava, in like little pockets of soil out in the lava, 1,274-year-old Douglas fir trees. So this is something we, we learn about uh, tree age. There's longevity under adversity. This is kind of a phrase used by Shulman. Trees grow really slow. They tend to live very long. So really slow-growing trees actually live long times. They're really dense wood. Uh, they have typically living environments where they're not exposed to fire or bugs or humans, and then they can live a long time. And incidentally, right here, right above uh, Albuquerque, up on the Sandia Crest, you've got 1,000-year-old, at least 1,000-year-old limber pines. These are growing right beneath the limestone on the, uh, the granite. And uh, there's dozens of them there, and they're really gnarled, you know, half-dead looking trees. I say at least a thousand because, like, this tree, we took a, an increment core out of it, and it was about eight inches long, and it had more than a thousand rings in it. And then the inside of that tree was hollow, okay? So there's probably at least another 100, 500 years in there uh, in the inside of that tree. So there, there are millennial age trees hovering right here above Albuquerque. Amazing. These old trees out there, out there. So, so now here are a couple of stories I thought uh, you folks, arborists and orchardists uh, and other folks dealing with urban trees would be interested in. And it's just a general point that trees have stories to tell. 
You know, old, especially old trees, they've been around people, been in an urban environment. They, 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 they record what happened to them. And this is an exa example. I was given this uh, a cross section of a tree, a ponderous pine growing near the Fuller Lodge in, in Los Alamos. So the Fuller Lodge was, this is, is still there. It's this amazing timber structure, vertical, giant vertical ponderosa pine logs in the walls, uh, two, two stories tall, and it was built um, in the 19 teens. And there used to be a much larger building there called the Big House. It was three stories tall, all pine logs. Giant, giant log, one of the biggest log structures, no doubt, ever built in the Southwest. Unfortunately, they tore it down. But this tree that you see on the right there was growing right next to the Fuller Lodge, and it died, and it was leaning over the lodge, and so they had it taken down. So they give me this cross section and ask me to, you know, when, when is this, when, what do you, can you see in this cross section? Well, interestingly, notice it's very concentric on this inside, and there's actually a couple scars right there and right there. There's a couple scars, and then it grows predominantly on that side. So it basically becomes oblong. It's very concentric, and then it's non-concentric. And you've probably seen this before. It's, you know, it's called reaction wood in general. And in conifers, um, you get uh, compression wood. On the downhill side, on the downslope side of the tree, that was where it will grow out if it's been tipped over. Right? And it's the opposite of that for angiosperms. For the hardwood trees, it's you get tension wood where it grows out on the uphill side. Anyway, you can use the, the change in concentricity to tell when the tree was tipped over. So it turns out there, these scars right here date to 1917, which is just exactly when they built the original big house building. So what was going on? Well, uh, probably this was a, they call it a, a tail hold tree, maybe, where they had they rack a cable around it with a, with a block, uh, a, a, you know, a pulley block for pulling logs around the area. I and mean, they were pulling logs all around there to build the house. So I suspect it could be that this tree was also just hammered by some logs hitting against it. But in any case, this tree was tilted and wounded during the construction of the, of the big structures there at that time. And then it grew oblong. <clears throat> and then notice this other little interesting little history in here. See this blue stain? Blue stain right there? A little bit of blue stain right there? Well, that's beetle attack. And, oh, there's the, there's the diagram of, you know, what you get on the downhill side, you get this, this compression wood, uh, which is indicative of the direction of the tilt. But the blue stain is very obvious in a couple of places, and sure enough, it's a beetle attack. And for years, I've seen these, these little gaps here, this little, little what I see, something like, like a pitch pocket. If you look at a cross section of a cookie, sometimes you see a, a ring where it's kind of bulging out, and it's got a little pitchy, kind of pitch in there. And we thought those were probably failed beetle attacks. And I, was, <laughs> I had surfaced this thing up, and I just took it to the fuller, and I said, you know, I always look inside of these things to see if I can see a beetle. I've never seen one before. So I looked inside of this one, <laughs> and darned if there wasn't a beetle in there. And there it is. See if you can see it. There's a beetle stuck in there from 1904. That's the date of that beetle attack. And uh, I was able to get it identified by a forest entomologist. So this is this beetle, you know, went in there, created this little cavity, laid its eggs, and it, the, the tree pitched it in and drowned it. And there it got preserved in time, you know, like a little time capsule. Right? So this is, again, these kind of things you never know. We come across stuff like this in tree rings all the time, little surprises of stuff that's recorded and embedded in the trees. Last story. So here's another little urban tree story. This is a, the old church in Hamas Springs, the old Presbyterian church, actually where I went to, went to Sunday school when I was a kid. And it was established in 1879. They built that church by uh, Reverend Shields, and you'll see on the left there an apricot tree. There's an apricot tree right there. And it was thriving in uh, this uh, picture that's from 1983 on the left. But it, in recent years, it died. Just in the last few years, it died. We're not sure why. They were trying to save it, but it died. There's, so it's kind of this little tree snag. So the, the church is trying to figure out what to do with it. They knew it was an old. They were curious about it. And I'm the tree ring guy, so they asked me to look at it and tell them how old it, it was and what else I could learn. So I, I actually took a tried to take a core sample with my increment bore, 
and it broke off <laughs> immediately. The apricot is hard wood. It broke the tip off my, you know, $350 increment bore in like one turn. So, so then I took a cross section. There was, there's three stems and the middle stem had already been cut. So there's a little stump in the middle there. And I took this section off of the stump. And then I took this little wedge section out of the, one of the standing stumps on the side. So interesting little story here. What it turns out was that the inner ring date of this guy is about 1890 or so. And it grew really happily for the first, uh-oh. What happened? Oh, okay. All right. Well, that was it. So it, it grew really well for the first 40 years of its life. I think Reverend Shields, the founder of the church, so this is a founder's tree. He planted it and he took care of it. And then the next guy, Reverend Barry, took care of it until he retired in like 1940 or so. But it starts to slow down its growth in the 1930s. And that's when, uh, by the 1950s, that center stem died. So what happened was, I think, this is speculation, that the Dust Bowl drought, they were watering this tree um, from the acequia, from the ditch. And it may have been in the 30s. They didn't have a village domestic water system. So they were, it may be in the 1930s, they, just, they couldn't water it as much. But anyway, it, it, the center stem died. And then it started growing better um, in the, the last, maybe from the 60s and 70s and 80s, it grew pretty well. And the last several couple of decades really slowed down its growth. And I'm not sure what, what happened. I think they were watering it, but just so warm. It's been so warm. And this is an old tree. It finally kicked off. So this is just a little history, you know, a history of this tree and what it recorded about its environment. And it, I've been able to tell the church folks that this was probably a founder's tree. And this, the last little part of that is, Interestingly, apricot trees, you know, old apricot trees are scattered around all over New Mexico. And one of the most famous dead apricot trees is the bishop's tree at the bishop's lodge in Santa Fe. And interestingly, they, the lodge there kept that old tree. It's dead, but they kept it because it's kind of aesthetic. They even, even got it propped up. You can see the little rod here holding up the dead tree. And this is actually a woodcut from Gustav Bauman in 1924. And I, I speculate that maybe, maybe even that tree that uh, is in Hamas Springs came from one of Lamy's orchard trees. He, he, had, he, he planted a lot of, of fruit trees and then gave, gave the cuttings and seedlings to people all around New Mexico. The Presbyterians and the Catholics didn't get along too well in the 19th century. But maybe, maybe by 1890 they were friendly enough that, that uh, the Hamas Springs tree came from the Lamy tree. Maybe. Well, again... Uh, I invite you to come to the Tree Ring Laboratory uh, and visit sometime. It's a great place to see big cookies like that sequoia. It's in, our, it's in the little display area there in the front of the building. And uh, kids really like to go to the lab too because there's lots of things they can touch and feel and stories to learn from tree rings. So I'll stop there. Thank you much. Okay, so um, did did we want to take some questions, or just go ahead and divert to the? Yeah, maybe maybe take a few questions. I also um, I brought some samples with me, including one of the oldest pieces of bristlecone pine ever collected, and I'll have them out there on a table here, in just a few minutes, and where you can come and take a look at some samples. But if anybody has any questions right now, I'd be happy to happy to field them, uh, or or answer your questions out in the in the, in the hallway. Okay, we'll catch you outside. Thank you.